All right, good morning. It's that time again. It is breakfast with the Bible. We are finishing up Psalm 73. This is the result of Asaph's visit to the sanctuary of God. This is his change in perspective. Uh, if you remember from the last uh, portion of Psalm 73, Asaph was kind of overwhelmed with this envy and this, I'm going to say, anger over the prosperity and the well-being of the wicked who seemed to be getting away with everything. Uh, he had said that it was so much that his, his faith had almost failed him. He, he was thinking that maybe this godly living was in vain, like it wasn't even worth it because what's the point? There's no payoff because everybody who's living wickedly is getting away with it and having just a good old time. So he finishes that section with this this change where everything, everything was, was adjusted. His view, his perspective was adjusted when he went to the sanctuary of God and understood the things that he previously had overlooked. So starting in verse 18, going to verse 28, it says, Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me up by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go over a whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I might declare all thy works. So again, we find ourselves following Asaph's confession that his perspective had drastically changed once he understood something of God noted in the previous verse. And verse 17 says, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. The light came on. Asaph recognized something his self-work view had not allowed him to see before. Verses 18 to 20 explain the substance of what he finally became aware of. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, cast them into destruction. They'll be brought into desolation, how utterly consumed with their terrors. It is important to consider what Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 16, verse 17, when Peter confessed that Jesus was Christ. He said, For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Excuse me. You see, when the lights came on, when part of who God is makes sense, it's not due to our wonderful grasp of knowledge or our immense level of intellect, but, but that God himself has allowed us, even caused us to recognize something. Without the Spirit of God's involvement and influence, no amount of study on our part will ever be enough to understand. Excuse me, my, my wrists are itching. Here, Asaph understood that it's, the security of the wicked is merely an illusion. It was an all indeed vanity. Slippery places indicate the truth that the wicked can and may very well fall at any moment. In verse 2, excuse me, uh, in verse 19, how are they brought into desolation as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors. Asaph makes mention of his own insecurity and fear of slipping, and now his perspective highlights the fact that it is in fact the wicked, yes, the wicked in slippery places. We're moving on to, yes, that is correct. That is verse 18. I don't know why I wrote verse 2. So yeah, surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou cast them down in destruction. Asaph is recognizing that they're in fact the ones in a place of little foundation, little security. 
consider the level of change gained from Asaph's recognition of these truths. The increase of confidence in God, his, his sudden sense of security in the salvation of the Lord. This shows us the importance of being involved in a Bible teaching fellowship and as well as our own personal devotion and dedication to the study of Scripture. Listen to what Spurgeon has to say, and it's, it's a little bit lengthy, but it, it, it bears listening to. It says, Sinner, you may fall now at once. The mountain yields beneath your feet. The slippery ice is melting every moment. Look down and learn your speedy doom. Yonder yawning gulf must soon receive you, while we look after you with hopeless tears. Our prayers cannot follow you. From your slippery standing place you fall and you are gone forever. Death makes the place where you stand slippery, for it dissolves your life every hour. Time makes it slippery, for every instant it cuts the ground from under your feet. The vanities which you enjoy make your place slippery, for they are all the ice which shall melt before the sun. You have no foothold, sinner. You have no sure hope, no confidence. It is a melting thing you trust to. Now, those are harsh words from Spurgeon, but they're true. It is this, this, I don't know, foolish grasp, this foolish confidence in the things of this world. These three verses point, excuse me, paint for us the vanity that permeates the life of the wicked. They're confused, they're consumed, they're blind. In verses 21 and 22, he says, Thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Now what he's saying here is he's confessing his folly regarding his initial statements and his considerable doubt really in the goodness and faithfulness of God. He, he was convicted. He was pierced, it says, pierced in his mind. He calls himself foolish and ignorant, a beast. Beast implies one without understanding, one without a solid grasp of truth. And in verse 23, his statement says, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. It's so powerful when he says that, nevertheless, even though I acted foolishly, thou, Lord, have never let go of me. What a wonderful promise we have from God, even, even when we forget he never forgets us. For even when we look away, his eyes are always upon us. As the hymn writer states, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. That's, that's a very powerful statement. Even though I thought foolishly, even though I was ignorant, even though I acted as a beast who really has no logic of God's way, in, in that sense of problem solving and understanding who God is. There is a great deal of recognition here. Asaph sees the vanity in their ways. He understands his foolishness in his previous perspective. He grasps the truth that God is faithful, that he will guide and ultimately receive him in the glory, which is verse 24. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me in the glory. Whom? Have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. Our hearts ought to be right there with that statement. Poole says this. He says, let sinners have an earthly prosperity. I am satisfied with thee and with thy favor. Since thou givest me support and conduct here and carriest me safe from hence to eternal glory, what do I need more or what can I desire more? He's saying, what else is there really that has this much significance than my confidence, than the promises in God toward me and toward believers? Verse 26, my flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He understands his inherent weakness in his flesh apart from God noting that true strength comes only from the Lord. My flesh and my heart fails. I am going to die. My body is going to decay. I'm going to get old. I'm going, Lord willing, and my body is going to begin to fail. My heart is going to begin to fail. My strength 
is going to begin to fail. But God is my portion forever. This takes me beyond that realm of death that so takes us uh, whole. Verse 27, for lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go whoring from thee. This verse gives us the hard truth that those who are not children of God will all find the same end. They will perish. Now this word perish not only designates physical death, but a loss of hope for anything else. Verse 28, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. It is good. It is good for all to draw near to God, to put our trust in him. So, so what is the practical application of this psalm? We often, you know, and I, I think I fail sometimes, we often go through these psalms and, and read them for what they are, but we, we kind of forget to look at, okay, what can I do with it? Okay, this is all good and fine for Asaph, but what does it mean for me? What does it mean for your life? How can I take what Asaph has put down here for us, because that's what it's there for. It's for, for us to learn. It's for our instruction. How can I use this in my life? If we notice any part of our attitude looking like the initial opening of this song, in this envy of the wicked, in this, I'm going to say, confusion of why are things going their way and things are not going my way? This, can I catch a break? If we ever find ourselves in that, in that mood, in that, in that, maybe that desire to complain about things just not working out the way we had hoped, or seeing the wicked do so well in society, which is a whole other story. When we get to that point, when we sense ourselves in that moment of looking around us and going, it's just not fair. We should immediately turn to God for wisdom and correction. Our trust in God should be so that the life of the wicked, excuse me, I wrote it down, but I forgot it. With the expectation of their need for self, with, excuse me, with the expectation of their need for salvation should have no impact on our confidence in God and his promises. The, the, the need for their salvation is, is of greatest importance, and it should be for us as well. But when we're, we're so consumed with the way things are going for them, who don't put their trust in the Lord, we need to get back into the word. We need to get back into the reminding ourselves what it says. You know, the, the, the Bible says that we need to hide his word in our hearts. That, that means that if I don't have access to my Bible at some point, that should be okay to the degree of how much has it been hidden in my heart? How much do I know it? How much have I memorized to the point to where I can just call it out? If I hide my heart excuse me, my, his word in my heart that I might not sin against him. It is this constant reminding ourselves of what it says. It says about how we should live, how we should respond to others, how we should, all these different things. And so the, the importance of what it says in verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. We need to keep that light on. If we ever get to the point where Asaph was beforehand, my faith is going to fail because I see everything working out for those who don't even trust in God. That's a, that's a, a shifty place to be because God's promises never change. They never, well, they never end. His promises are true. So we need to remind ourselves of that. We need to continue continue our confidence in him, even when things don't quite make sense or they're even uncomfortable or undesirable or unpleasant. As I've said before, and I will constantly say, God is still good, even if we're not necessarily enjoying ourselves. 
So that finishes up Psalm 73. Uh, we will be moving to Psalm 74 here soon. Uh, I've got some other things I need to kind of uh, dig into. Um, some things have come up, and I'm quite, and I'm moderately excited for them. I don't quite know exactly what that will be, but um, maybe I'll share that with you at some point. But uh, as always, thank you for watching. Feel free to to give me some suggestions. Maybe we can we can step off of this journey through the Psalms like we have before, kind of hit on some other topics and various things. Um, if not, no big deal. Uh, we will continue to push forth and, and try to get through this very large uh, book in Scripture. And we will tackle more as we, as we see them. Um, reminder, be in prayer for Israel. Uh, be watchful, be mindful of the, of the Word, what it says how we should conduct ourselves, and what we should be preparing for. Uh, thank you, and God bless.